Good morning, everyone. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Uh, this morning we will uh, have our service in this uh, small place. And uh, as you know, we have so many uh, uh, constructions uh, going on in this place. And so a big hall uh, is being renovated. And uh, so that's why uh, today we have uh, such a change. And I believe a change is uh, also good, right? And then we are close to each other, we can, uh, you know, see each other closely. And uh, as I see you in this hall, you really look great. So I'm very thankful, really, uh, to stand before you uh, this morning. And uh, also, at the same time, uh, the main lecturer for this uh, chapel class happened to have traveled uh, yesterday. And so he appointed me uh, to have this class with you, and I hope you are not disappointed. Are you? No, thank you. <laughs> so let's read the Bible, the book of uh, Matthew chapter 7. So Matthew chapter 7, and uh, we will talk about the will of God today. Matthew chapter 7 and we have uh, verse uh, 21. Verse 21, uh, this is what the Bible says. Uh, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, uh, but uh, he who does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out the devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Uh, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and those them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew. And they, beat, and they beat upon uh, that house, and he fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and those them not, shall be like unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and he fell, and great was the fall of it. And uh, it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, uh, the people were astonished at his uh, doctrine. Uh, we've read until uh, verse 28. Uh, last Sunday, as we attended this chapel class together, I remember uh, the, the lecturer spoke about, do you remember what he talked about? Yes, he, talk, he spoke about uh, the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Do you remember everyone? Do you remember? Yes, actually, as we think about uh, our life, you know, after we die, then you cannot boast about the things you have in this world today. Is that so? Yes, you could boast, I have money, you could boast, I am young, you could boast, I'm healthy, you could boast about many things that you have right now today in this life, but when you think about the life to come, especially the Bible speaks about in the book of Luke chapter 16, about the rich man and the poor Lazarus. Even though the Bible did not speak much about their lives that they lived in this world, the Bible did not speak about, like, you know, when you think about this rich man, for example, and you go to him, hey, rich man, I want to know about your life that you lived in this world. And then maybe you can write a book. Oh, I was born in such a family. This is how I was able to amass the kind of money or the wealth I was having. I married this kind of a lady. These are the children I was having. This is the life I lived in this world. He can write a book out of the life that he lived. But when you see in the Bible, his life has been summarized only in one verse. His life in this world. The life that he lived in this world was spoken about shortly. In just one verse, I don't know whether we can look at it once more again in the book of Luke chapter 16, because that's exactly the scripture that we read uh, last week. 
as from 19, right? And there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fair sumptuously every day. That's the kind of a life the Bible speaks about that he lived in this world. The Bible did not speak about how he became rich. The Bible did not focus on the life that he lived here in this world. But you know, and I think that's one of the deceits of Satan that people are undergoing even today. They only think about the life in this world, but they don't think about the life that is awaiting them after they die. And so, as you think about that kind of a life, right, that people are not even interested in, they're not interested in knowing what will happen to them after they die. But as you know, the Bible says, and, you know, it's not somebody else who said, it's the Bible. The Bible says, it's appointed unto men to die. How many times do we die, by the way? Once, right? It's appointed unto men to die once, and after death, the judgment. And so, death is not the end of everything. Many people are deceived to think that once they die, that's the end of everything, but that's not the case. The Bible says, after you die, there is the judgment of God that is waiting for you. And this judgment is about what? The judgment of God is about the distinction between the righteous people and the sinners. Righteous to go to heaven and sinners to go to hellfire. Yes, we have many pastors today, as you know. We have many teachers of the Bible today. We have many churches and we have many denominations. And I'm very sure today being a Sunday, there are many preachers who are standing the way I'm standing, preaching the word. But when you think about what they are teaching, their message can only be summarized in two words. Do good and don't do evil. Is that so? Yes, they speak it in different ways. But what they speak and they teach people, hey, do good, don't do evil. Oh, if you do good, God will bless you. If you do evil, God will curse you. But when you think in the Bible, that teaching is not based on the Bible. Why is that so? There's no one who did good in the eyes of God, good enough to be blessed by God. And we know for sure the blessings of God comes to man through the means of grace only. God will bless you not because you did something in exchange unto him. God is not waiting. Let me see what so and so will do for me and then I will bless him. I mean, God is not like that. The Bible says everything that is there in this world belongs to who? Belongs to God, right? And so God is asking you, what is it that you can give unto me? If you give me too much money, do you think I'll be pleased with that? I mean, does God need your money? Does God need your what? God does not anything, does not need anything from man whatsoever. But if there's something that God is willing to do today, God, is want, God wants to bless man without any conditions whatsoever. But then when you learn these words, oh, you know, I hope you can serve God and God will bless you. I hope you do well and God will be happy with you. That's not the Bible. There are many people in the Bible that were blessed by God without doing anything whatsoever. When you think about the story of Jacob and Esau, actually, Jacob was blessed. Is that so? Was he blessed? Was he blessed by the father? Yes, indeed, he was blessed by the father. But did he do anything? No. For him to be blessed, the only one who worked for his blessing is the mother, Rebecca. You know the story of Cain and Abel. There are two people as well, brothers. One the first brother, the other one the second brother. But when you think about that, Cain was a tear of the ground, and the Bible says he brought the fruits of the ground. But, but, God did not respect his offering. Also, God did not respect Cain at the same time. How about Abel? Abel was received through the offering that he gave. Actually, these two brothers, you know, as they are coming before God, they must have tried to know what's the will of God. We are standing before God, but should we know exactly what God is happy with and that which God is not happy with? What's God pleased with? Let us know. Hey, you are my father. Had they come to Adam? Had they come to their mother Eve? To know the will of God, I'm very sure they would have known the will of God, but they were not interested in that. That's why they went as they thought it is good for them. I mean, Cain thought, ah, this is how I should stand before God. 
and then brought all the things of the ground, the things that he got after, after his own sweat. But when he st stood before God with that, the Bible says God rejected him. And God also rejected his offering. One time I was having a Bible study with one uh, eminent professor in this country. I don't want to name, his, uh, to name him. And I'm asking him, why do you think God refused the offering of Cain? And then he gave an answer, very funny answer. And he says, ah, God is not a vegetarian. <laughs> very funny, right? <laughs> ah, you know, mungu si mboga. God does not eat vegetables. God eats meat. I don't know. <laughs> he was humorous only, right? But something very important, we have to know the fruits that Cain is bringing before God, they are coming from where? The Bible says the fruits of the ground is the offering that Cain tried to present before God, and God rejected that. And so, when you think about that, Cain is forsaken, you know, even also Esau is forsaken. There are many other examples in the Bible. In the New Testament, we know the story of the first son as well. Do you know that story? Yes, we have two sons in the book of Luke chapter 15. One is the prodigal son. He went to the far country after receiving the portion from the father. You know that story? Yeah, he received the portion. Now he's going to the far country. And the Bible says he wasted the father's wealth in a riotous life. You know, right? He didn't go and do business very well. He didn't go and try to save the father's money. No, he was wasting and squandering the father's money in a riotous kind of way of living. Meanwhile, there's the first son who stayed with the father, serving the father and obeying the father. You know that story, is that so? She says, father, I served you and I obeyed you. But then, when the two sons are standing before the father, there's someone who receives everything from the father. He receives shoes, he receives the ring, the best robe, the fatted calf, everything that the father wanted to give, he gave unto him, and he received that not because he did something good in the eyes of the father. The father bestowed grace unto him. How about the one who had been serving? Father, I served you, I obeyed you. What did the father say? The father did not give me him even a kid of the God. I served, but he gave me nothing. I mean, this first son is trying to ask the father the payment from the works that he did before the father. But then the father does not live like that. That father is the shadow of God himself. God does not receive you because you've done something. If God has to receive you, if God has to bless you, everyone, he only does that through the means of uh, grace. But now many pastors, many churches, many preachers of the gospel, or rather, whatever they are preaching, they are telling people to live like the first son. Be like the first son. What does that mean? Obey God. Serve God. God will bless you. No, God is not working in that way. There are many stories in the Bible. Actually, there are many people who stood before Jesus while they were at their wit's end. They came to a point whereby they have nothing good whatsoever, but then when they met with Jesus, they were able to receive the grace of Jesus. And so you have to understand it from the onset. That God accepts you only through the means of grace. That there's nothing you can do to be loved, to be accepted, and to be blessed by God. Everyone, amen? It's through the means of uh, grace, right? So that's why this grace is so amazing. Those who have received the grace of God, they are really amazing people as well. And so, when you think about uh, this rich man and this poor man, Lazarus, yes, their life in the world was spoken about only in just one verse. That's the life they lived in this world. There was a rich man eating well, putting on clothes. I mean, he's living like a king. And there's a poor man who's a beggar, who's very sick, and he's coming even to the crumbs that are falling from the master's table. You know, right? From the rich man's table. That's how the Bible speaks about their lives in this world. But then, as we read continuously, one thing that I'm very thankful about is that death does not fear rich people, does it? Does it? No. Kifo kinawogo pamatajiri kweli. Ah, yeah, this guy is rich. I can receive too much money from him. 
I don't need to kill this man. Is death like that? No, <laughs> right? Actually, there was somebody, he was a king, and this king was having so many servants. You know, as a king, you can have as many servants as you want, right? Is that so? You can have singers to come to sing for you anytime you want. You can call storytellers. You can call entertainers of different kinds. As a king, you can appoint people to take care of your clothes. I think none of you is having somebody who's taking care of their wardrobe, right? Every one of you is taking care of your clothes. Is that so? Take care of your clothes. Take care of your face by yourself. But if the king wants, he can appoint such people to do that, right? And so this king was having so many servants as well, but there's one servant that was appointed. And that servant was supposed to come and sit next to the king. Actually, he's sitting at the bed of the king, and when the king comes in, he's very tired, he wants to sleep. The servant's duty was to speak some nice and good stories, right? Like a lullaby. You know a lullaby, right? <laughs> Have you ever sung a lullaby to your sons and your daughters or else? Have you listened a lullaby from your mother? Maybe you can't remember, right? When I see these boys and girls who are troublemakers, <laughs> right? Actually, all of us, we are troublemakers, right? Your mother says, hey, sleep. You don't sleep. Is that so? <laughs> and then your mother starts to sing a lullaby, right? And then as you are listening the lullaby from the mother, eventually you fall asleep, Right? Everyone, mothers are great people. Everyone, amen? The mother is a, the mother is great, who has been able to raise all of us who are here, right? Without the mother, we are nowhere, right? And so, the king chose one servant who was supposed to be singing a lullaby unto him. I mean, not even a lullaby as such, but he's supposed to tell him very nice and pleasing stories. As the king is smiling and laughing and he's like, you know, excited and then he falls asleep, right? But one day the king came. He came from uh, a very busy day and he's trying to sleep, but then, you know, the servant is not speaking any story. And so the king is telling him, hey, what's wrong with you today? You have to speak a good story to me. And so the servant said, king, you know, I really want to apologize today. Why is that so? There are many stories that I spoke, but today I have no good story for you. You know, the only story that I have is sad and I'm afraid if I speak the sad story, you may even kill me. So I don't want to speak that bad story or that sad story to you. But all the same, the king insisting, no, even though it's not a good story, speak still. Speak still, is that so? So now the servant started. Hey, king, live forever. Can anyone live forever, everyone? No, right? But then he was uh, wishing the king to live forever. Oh, king, live forever. I have a question to ask it to you. Where is your father? Where is his father? Actually, you can only become a king until your father dies, right? Oh, what funny question are you asking me? My father is dead. Yeah, your father is dead. How about your grandfather? My grandfather, he's also dead. Right? Oh, how about uh, your mother, your aunts, and you? He was only asking about people who died. He said, yeah, all of them died. And then the servant said, now, hear my story. Listen to my story. Death has been taking other people one by one, but this death has never forgotten you. Is this a good story, everyone? Sad story, isn't it? Oh, you have not been forgotten yet. I'm very sure this morning, there's no single person among us who is seated here whose death has forgotten, right? I think death is numbering each one of them. I will take so and so. This day, oh, my name is Wimana. Wimana, I am going to take him maybe two days later. I don't know when, right? But all of us, we are in the list of those people who are going to be taken by death, one after the other, until one day, maybe you come, when you come here 50 years later, no one will be here, right? All of us, we are going to face death at least. And in as much as we are sure we are born in this world, much more we should be sure that we are going to die once. Is that so? 
But now something very sad. People are living that this they are not going to die. Is that so? The Bible says that it's appointed unto men to die once, and after death there is God's judgment. And the Bible says again, the foolish man goes to the house of feasting, and the wise man goes to the house of uh, mourning. And you may ask, why is that so? The Bible gives the answer, better to go to the house of mourning because that's the end of every man, and the one who's still alive will have to keep it in his heart. Can we read this one verse, everyone, in the book of Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes. Yeah, this is one of uh, the wisdom that Solomon left to us. So chapter 7, verse, uh, verse 4, the Bible says, chapter 7, and verse 4, the heart of the wise is in the house of uh, mourning. Right? Can all, of us, can all of us read together? One, two, three, go. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Right? We have two houses here, right? The house where there is mourning and the house where there is a, there is mirth, right? There is feasting. Is that so? They are enjoying, they have a lot of drink, they have a lot of, uh, you know, laughter on their lips, they are dancing maybe. You know, you can understand the house where there is a lot of, you know, joy and happiness. Is that so? And then, there's another house where people are mourning, they are crying, they are very sad, right? Some people can never accept to be consoled. Other people are like, you know, continuously disappointed about their lives. Which house do you want to go to yourself? Right? Raise up your hand if you go to the house of mourning, mourning. Nitaenda kwa nyumba ya huzuni. Nitaenda kuhuzunika pamoja na wao. Raise up your hand. Raise up your hand. I will go to the house of uh, feasting and enjoy together with other people. You are laughing. You don't want to answer me. <laughs> Raise up your hand if you don't want to go to no house. I don't want to go to any house. <laughs> yes, right? Two houses only. You can go to the house of mourning, but the Bible says it's better to go to the house where people are mourning. Why is that so? The Bible gives us the answer on verse 2, right? The verse 2 says uh, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all Man, right? Are you a man? Yes, you know, you are going to, you, you, your house will come to the point whereby they are mourning you, not anybody else. To the house of mourning, because that's the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. He has to keep that story, that kind of, you know, truth. It's very true. It's a fact that one day I will be no more. And then once I'm no more, all the things that I've been trying to get in this world become so meaningless. The kind of a life, the kind of glory I try to get in this world, the kind of, you know, the big degrees you are trying to get today, you know, the kind of family you are trying to keep and uh, raise, when you die, everything comes to, everything comes to, an end. Is that so? One time I was moving around and I saw how they advertised the Tasca. Is it Tasca? You know Tasca, right? You know Tasca? Anyone who's a fan of Tasca? Tasca is your friend? <laughs> you don't want to say, right? <laughs> you are saying like, how can you ask such a question? It's obvious. <laughs> And so, Tasca was having a big advertisement, a very big billboard in, here around uh, Ruaraka, because Ruaraka actually is home for Tasca, you know, right? And then they had uh, drawn pictures of, uh, you know, beautiful ladies and uh, uh, beautiful, I mean, handsome gentlemen, right? And then they were dancing, they are sharing a glass of uh, Tasca, right? And they gave this advertisement. They said, it makes us equal. It has no equal, right? Tasca makes us equal. 
It has no echo. I wanted to replace Tasca with death. Do you understand? Kifo makes all people echo. Death makes all people echo. And death has no, no echo. Do you understand? So one day, each one of us, regardless of how beautiful you are, or how ugly you are, how sickly you are, how you know, healthy you are, regardless of how rich, poor, young, or old you are, death makes us to be, to be equal. It has no equal. And so the Bible says, people who are still alive today, they have to know that one day they are going to stand before God after they come out from the flesh. That's the Bible. Is that so? It is wisdom. The Bible says it's wisdom because that's the end of all men. And so, I was speaking to the king and telling him, hey, king, you know, I want to tell you, you have to know one day you are dying. You are king, yes. You are glorious, yes. You have wealth, yes. You have authority, yes. You know, everybody is worshiping you, yes. Everybody has exalted you, yes. But one day, you are what? Yes. Death has, has taken all the people one by one, but it has never forgotten you. You see, when people are living today, they don't even have this single idea that one day could be their last day. They have no idea that one day they will have to die. That's how Satan are deceiving people. I mean, deceiving people continuously as if, as if they are living forever. So that devil Deceiving all people, and they live not thinking about the day they are going to stand before, before God. And so the Bible says, it's appointed. Appointed what? Once, not even many times. It's appointed to die once after death. They you know, if you're supposed to die twice, for example, you know, right? You see, when I was in uh, primary school, especially class six, class six was like, you move from primary to high school. But then suddenly, the system changed on me, right? Now the system will go, I have to go to class 8. But class 6, you know, I failed to go to the high school. And so they gave me a chance to, to repeat. Is that so? Oh, I went to repeat and I passed now very well. Went to high school, went to university. Nothing was ever a problem afterwards, right? I was given that chance. Is that so? But how about your life? You live one life and you die one death. Kwela Mawongo, you are looking at me as if I'm lying, right? It's a very naked truth, right? We live once and we die once. And so the Bible says, it's appointed unto men to die once, after death, the judgment. The judgment of God distinguishes sinners and righteous people. Sinners go to hellfire. Righteous people go to heaven. And so in the book of Luke chapter 16 that we learned last Sunday, we can see after they died, after the rich man died, the Bible says was a th he was actually being tormented. He's in a place of torment, a place where there's no grace whatsoever. In this world, even though you say there's no grace, but there's a lot of grace that we are enjoying God even today. Air is... By the grace of God. Is that so? We have air, we have sunshine, we have rain, we have everything that we are enjoying, and we have received that from. So this world is the world of grace. Let me call it that way. But in hellfire, is a place where there is no grace whatsoever. That's a place where even you ask for a drop of water. Is that so? Oh, give me, tell Lazarus to come with, you know, a drop of water on his finger and cool my my tongue. That is hellfire. Hellfire is a place where there is no grace of God at all. And so, while this man was rich, this rich man was living in this world, yes, his life is envied by everybody. He's eating very well, drinking very well. He's making a party on a daily basis. He can do as many things as he wants to do with his wealth that he was enjoying. The rich man must have lived like a king as he wanted. Even the Bible says he was clothed in a purple. Purple is the color of the king. You know, right? So I don't think he can put on clothes like mine or yours, you know. He was always 
you know, shining, everybody enjoy, I mean, envies their, his life. But now, after his death, we can see that there is nothing to envy there whatsoever. And so, uh, the Bible says, here is a place where the fire is not quenched and the worm dies not. It's not a place where, where you can endure. Some people have got this false understanding. Ah, you know, God is love. How can he send people to hellfire? <laughs> right? Yes, God is love. Actually, God loves your sin. He doesn't love your sin. Is that so? Yes, even though your father and your mother loves you, your friends love you, but then they cannot love the sickness that is there in you. They cannot say, oh, okay, we love your malaria. Please stay with your malaria. Can they say like that? Oh, we love you. Your what? <laughs> we love your COVID still. Live with your COVID. They, nervous. they love you, yes, but what they love, they love you, not the sickness that is there in you. Because they know if they leave the sickness that is trying to kill you, then you die. That's why whoever has the person that he loves, when the person is sick, they try their best to take them to where? To the hospital for treatment. If, is that so? And so what the Bible says here is very important. God is love, but he does not love sin. You know, in the book of Matthew that we read, Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 7, this is the sermon of Jesus. And this is the very first sermon of Jesus when he came into the world. Is that so? There are many sermons of Jesus in the Bible, but the very first sermon of Jesus starts with Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 chapter 6 and chapter 7 and chapter 8, he comes down from the mountain. But now, at a certain given point, in Matthew chapter 6, he spoke about something. In Matthew chapter 7, there are many previous verses that we didn't read, but in verse 21 he says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right? But there's somebody who can go there. Who is that? Who is that everyone? Can we see Matthew chapter 7, verse 21? The Bible says, but, right? Can we read together? But he, the will of my father, which is in heaven. The key word there is the will of the father. What's the will of my father? What's the will of God? This is something that we have to think about, right? And so, according to you, what's the will of God? According to your understanding, what could be the will of God? Anyone who can try it? The will of God? No one? What's the will of God? Well, can you try? No? <laughs> you are afraid of uh, making a mistake? Mistakes are okay. How about your friend? What's the will of God? You are like, why are you asking me? <laughs> yes. Gentlemen, what's the will of God? Obeying his commandment. What's the will of God? What's the will of God, everyone? Have you asked yourself that question in your life? Because actually all of us, we are dealing with God, right? I mean, on daily basis, we are dealing with God, but we have to know now what's the will of God? Because Jesus also is saying, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Right? And Jesus is adding one more verse, verse 22. Many will say unto me in that day. That's a very particular day. That's the day of judgment. What will they say? Lord, Lord. Right? We cast out the demons in your name. Did they cast demons in the name of Jesus? Yes. We prophesied in your name. Yes, they prophesied. In whose name? In the name of a? The name of the Lord Jesus. Is that so? And we did many wonderful works in your name. That's the Bible. Many will say unto me that day. Can we read all of us together? One, two, three, go. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out the devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. These people, as they were being rejected by the Lord, they are coming, they are kind of appealing before God. Lord, how come you say you don't know me? I'm the one who cast out the demons in your name. I'm the one who stood before people and I prophesied in your name. I'm the one who did many 
wonderful works in your name. How come you say you don't know me? Something very important here is to be able, we have to know exactly what's the will of God that the Bible speaks about. If casting out demons is not the will of God, if prophesizing is not the will of God, somebody said, keeping the law, keeping the Ten Commandments is the will of God. That's not the will of God. The Bible says as many as all of the works of the law, they are under a curse. You know, right? You can never be blessed simply because you are trying to keep the law of God. The Bible says, it's the Bible, not me. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. Can we read that one verse? So that is the Bible. For as many as are of the works of the law. Actually, when you read this word, Yes, in the book of uh, Galatians, chapter 3 and verse 10, this is what the Bible says, right? Okay. For as many as are of the works of the law. To be of the works of the law, what does that mean, right? Especially the one who gave the answer saying that keeping the law is the will of God. You have to understand this very you know, you have to listen to this word very carefully. See, the Bible says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. To be of the works of the law is to rely on the works of the law is to be under a curse. This is the Bible. If this was the words of some people, then we can reject that and say, hey, this is nonsense. Let us keep the law and the God will bless you. But what the Bible says, if you're trying to rely on the law to go and stand before God, then you are under, you are under what? Under a curse, is that so? For the Bible says, says, for it is written, this is again written in the Bible, cursed is everyone who does not continue in everything that is written in the book of the law to do them. Right? That's the Bible. You are cursed, not because of anything else. If you are able to abide by the law from the time you are born until the time you die, hello, from the time you are born until the time you die, you are able to abide by the law and keep everything. So that's what the Bible says there, right? Cast is everyone who does not continue. To continue means keep the law of God from the time you are born until the time you die. And in all things, all things, that means every single law that God has given to humankind. If you're able to keep the law in that way, then you can receive the blessings of God through the means of uh, the law. If not, then you receive a curse. What's the real curse? The real curse to go to hellfire. To be cursed is not to be sick. Some people think, ah, if you are poor, then you are under a curse. If you are not well educated, then that's a curse. If you are a sickling, then you know, that, that's a curse. If you have no money, that's, that's not the Bible. The Bible says the real curse is to go to hellfire. What's the real blessing? To go to heaven. So if you are trying to be justified through the means of the law, you are trying to stand before God through the law, the Bible says you are under a curse. For it is written. Written where? In your Bible that you have yourself. Cast is everyone who does not continue in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. It says you continue in all things. But none of the human beings, whether they are Jews or Gentiles. Recently, our founder was in Israel. I think two Sundays back we had that testimony, right? Do you remember that testimony? Yeah, Jews uh, are people who are trying to insist and say we have to keep the law of Moses. They have never come into the life of Jesus. They have not known Jesus yet. Something very amazing is to know is that even though they are under the law, the Bible says you are under a curse. Because of that, I think that's why they just rejected the New Testament. They don't believe in the New Testament. They just believe in the Old Testament. But something very important to know is very simple. Even though it's like that, God spoke about another covenant even in the Old Testament. Hey, the days are coming, says the Lord. I will give you a new covenant. Right? That will be a different covenant altogether. A covenant that is different from the covenant that I gave to your father 
when I was moving them from the land of Egypt, taking them into the land of uh, Canaan. I want to give you a new covenant. People have not known the new covenant yet. This old covenant, if you lie on the law, the Bible says, as many as are of the works of the law, they are under a curse, not a blessing. And so we are trying to know, then, what's the will of God? If that's not the will of God, if becoming a prophet is not the will of God, if casting out demons in the name of Jesus is not the will of God, if performing many miracles in his name is not the will of God, if keeping the law is not the will of God, then what could be the will of God? The Bible also is very accurate on this. You see, in the Bible, uh, in the book of actually, in the Bible, there are many verses here that we have to read at the same time. In the book of uh, Second Peter, Second Peter, First Peter, sorry, First Peter, <clears throat> First Peter, chapter one. And uh, <clears throat> verse 15, the Bible says, But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Verse 16 also, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Right? Who's telling us this way? Who's saying this? You to be holy is, is a, the will of God. Everyone amen? He says, be holy for I am holy, right? If we have to know the will of God, then we have to go back to the Bible. What's the will of God? God says, be holy for I am holy. Maybe here there's no word like, this is my will, right? You may say, ah, this is the will of Peter. Who wrote the book of First Peter? No, this is the word of God. Is that so? Be holy, for I am holy. And then, when you check some other verses later, in the book of, uh, in the book of also, in the book of First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3, this is what the Bible says. K. <coughs> Here is even, it is even more clear, right? For this is the will of God, right? Even your sanctification. I want just to stop on that first part of verse, verse 3. It is the, it's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should be holy. Sanctification means to be holy. That's the will of God upon each and every single person. If you have to go to heaven, then the Bible says you have to be, to be holy. Heaven is a holy place. Heaven is holy, is that all? Heaven is holy, no sinner can enter into the kingdom of heaven. Is that all? This is my will, you have to be holy. Be holy for I am holy, that's the will of God. Even though this is very simple, even though God spoke about this in a very clear manner, people are not trying to, you know, listen to this. They think, ah, if I just go to church, I think that's okay. If I try to offer some money, that's okay. If I try to obey God's law, that's still okay. God does not say like that. God says, be holy, for I am holy. Without being holy, without being sanctified. Meaning what? If you have sin, even if it's a little bit of it. Chembe, chembe, adambi. You have just a speck of sin in your heart. God says he cannot accept you. You have to be holy. And God says, be holy, for I am holy. That is to be apart from sin. That is the will of God. So, the people that you are talking about in the book of Matthew chapter 7, yes, they cast out the demons, but they were having sin in their hearts. Still, they prophesied in the name of Jesus, but they were still having sin in their hearts. They did many wonderful works in the eyes of God, yes, but they were still having sin in their hearts. Yes, 
Satan allows people to prophesy with sin in their hearts. Satan allows people to go to church while they still have sin in their hearts. Satan allows people to do many wonderful works while they still keep sin the way it is in their hearts. That's not the will of God. Something that, you know, you have to know for sure, you can never go to heaven when you still have sin in your heart. So the Bible says, be holy for I am holy. This is my will. This is the will of my father who sent me to you. You know, even your holiness, even your sanctification, be holy for I am holy. If you cannot become holy, then you can only go to hellfire. With the story that we know of in the book of uh, Luke chapter 16, yes, Lazarus was poor, but he was holy. Lazarus was sick, but he was holy. That's why the Bible says when he died, he was carried by the angel into the bosom of uh, Abraham. Abraham was the father of uh, faith. He had faith. He prepared that holiness within himself. And that's why when he died, there was never a problem. Death is not a problem for those people who are holy. When you are holy, death becomes like the gate that opens you know, or ushers you into the eternal world. Right? The world we are living in is just a very short period of time. It's a world which has got to end after a while. But the world do you go to after you die, that is the eternal world. That's why life in hell is eternal, life in heaven is also eternal. And so, here, uh, as we, we see the will of God, right? For the, this is the will of him, the will of God, you know, even your sanctification, even your holiness. You be holy, for I am holy. That's the will of God. You know, you can bend and change the will of men, but then we can never change the will of God. You cannot bend the will of God. You cannot just say, hey, just be nice a guy, be a nice lady, then everything will be fine, you know? Don't, don't, don't just commit sin like that, right? No, the Bible says, be holy, for I am holy. And so to me, as I came to know the truth, you know, the Bible says we all of us came into the world having the, the seed of sin in us, right? We are sinners, not because we committed sin. The Bible says we became sinners. Sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death by sin. Death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. We became sinners, not because of the wrong things we are doing today. Many people have this understanding. Oh, I'm a sinner because of my wrong doing. So if I don't do anything wrong, then everything will be fine. That's not the Bible. In the book of Romans, Romans uh, chapter 5. <clears throat> so verse 12. So verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. When did you all become sinners? When did you all become sinners? They became sinners in Adam. Right? When did you become sinners? You didn't become a sinner when you started to steal your mother's uh, Money, some small money from your mother, right? He has made some balance somewhere, and then you go and just take, you know, and say, I've done something wrong, you know. <laughs> no, that time, right? The Bible says, through one man, Adam, sin came into the world, and death by sin. Death spread upon all men, for all have sinned. And so, you are born bearing the sentence of death upon you. But then, as you are living every day, you don't have that sentence of death upon you. That's why it's also not easy for you to listen to the voice of Jesus. For the Bible says, time is coming and time is now when the dead shall listen to the voice of the Son of God, and if they listen, they shall live. But before that death comes to you, you cannot listen to the voice of the Son of God. Surely, just he's speaking, 
But then the voice of the Son of God, the voice of Jesus, can only be listened and hearkened unto by those people who are dead in the eyes of God. So time is coming, time is now, when the dead shall listen to the voice of the Son of God, and when they listen, they shall do what? Everyone, they shall live. That's the Bible. But now, hear what the Bible says. Death came unto us in Adam. Therefore, as by one man sin came into the world, and death by sin, and death spread upon all men, for all have sinned. When did you become a sinner? Satan deceives you and tells you you are a sinner because of your wrongdoings. Hey, you have done something, no, that's why you are a sinner. No, that's not the Bible. You are committing and doing the soever wrong things you are doing because already you have the seed of sin in you. Everyone, are we together? Do you understand? Yeah, this is the Bible. It's not me. If this was the story of somebody who's standing in front, of, in front of you and saying these stories, then you can just deny and throw away those stories because they will be meaningless. They will be the teachings of men. But the teaching of the Bible that you have and I have says that, you know, through one man, Adam, sin came into the world, death by sin, death spread upon all men, for all have sinned. Now wonder why, even though you want to overcome sin by yourself, you, don't, you are not able to overcome sin. Even though the law threatens you, oh, if you do this and this, you are going to be punished in this and that way. You know the law of Kenya, right? You know the law of Kenya? Yes, the law of Kenya has got so many things to threaten you so that you may not do those wrong things. But still, people go ahead and break the law. Is that so? And when you go to the prison, right? We do the mind education in the prison. And so one time I was uh, having a the audience of only inmates. Inmates, I was staying in Kisumu. I won't say which prison, but Kisumu City has got actually five prisons, right? So I was in one of them. And in front of me, there were so many inmates there. So I began to ask them, even though I knew well, it's not really good manner to ask an inmate who has been sentenced. You try to ask them what kind of sin they committed. But then I began to ask, hey, you, what kind of sin you committed? Number one says, rape. Number two, defilement. Number three, incest. Almost everything same, right? Defilement, incest, whatever, right? Yeah, even though they knew that the Lord threatens, and the Lord says if you defile, then you're going to be in prison at least 20 years and above. You know, right? You know, right? If you rape... 20 years and above. But do still people rape? Do, still, do they still rape? Yes? They know well. Imagine you lose 20 years of your life. You know. Is that so? Or maybe most of you are around the age of 20, right? Imagine for 20 years you are not there. You know. Because... They go and rot in prison. Some of them, they get old. When they come out from the prison, they find their wives are taken by other men, you know. You understand, right? Even though the law of Kenya has got so many threatenings of telling people, don't do this. If you do this, then this will happen to you. Still, people go ahead and do what? And they break the law. And so God knows very well. Are you human beings? The only thing that, you know, can bring you back to me is my grace. Do you understand? It's not that people want to do those evil things. The law really threatens and try to contain us, try to stop us to do the wrong things, but it doesn't happen according to our will as well. And so most of the people when you are there in prison and ask them, hey, let me ask you, why, do you, why did you commit the wrong things that you did? And then they said, Pastor, I didn't want to do the wrong things I did. You didn't want to, then why did you do it? I don't know how, why I did it. Whether they killed somebody, because their mother is there as well, whether they have raped, they have, whether they have defiled, whether they are what, you know. One time I went to Kitari prison as well, and I'm asking, uh, you know, one uh, handsome young man, he was about, you know, around 40, 45, middle-aged person. And I'm asking him, hey, you know, what sin brought you here in this place? And then he said, you know, I'm very sorry to tell you this, but 
I am the man who also defiled. Why did you defile? <laughs> and then he said, let me be frank today. When they go there, they are judged and they are condemned. Eventually, they come to be frank, right? Let me be frank today. When I was standing in court, I was trying to defend myself. I was trying to plead not guilty, but here there's no meaning because already I am sentenced. And this man said, you know, it was my habit to do what? To defile. But it had never been a problem to me. But that day, it became really a very big problem, and I was arrested, I was taken to prison, and eventually, when I stood before the court, I was sentenced 20 years of imprisonment. And so I'm asking him, why did you defile? You didn't have a wife? No, what do you mean? I have a family. I have a wife, a beautiful one, by the way. But still, he did what? What does that mean? He came to believe in himself, even though I defile that will never be a problem. How can there be not a problem after you have defiled? But because he did it once, twice, thrice, you know, and that was not a problem, he felt, even though I do it again, that will never be a problem to me. So I told him, yes, to defile is a problem, but there's a bigger problem that you have in you. Thinking and believing that even though you defile, that will never be a problem. How can that be not a problem? He came to be deceived by Satan. Satan deceives people. And so, when you come to have this death sentence in you, this is our founder, I mean, our founder appointed one of our senior pastors to be in charge of the mind education in prison. Him, that pastor, he used to be an inmate. And this is a story he says all the time. He says when they're in the prison, especially those people who are sentenced to death, they normally live a normal life. They are very happy. They are like, you know, playing, you know, this and that kind of a game. Of course, they are in a place whereby they cannot run away. But then one time, one day, they bring a very nice meal to them. You know, sir, right? So when they come for lunch, they see a very nice meal. That very good and nice meal is a sign that one of them is going to be taken and be killed. But problem is they don't know who. You understand, right? You can imagine all of you like those kind of inmates, you know, have been sentenced to death. But then death is not there to them. They don't feel death surely because, you know, after all they say, okay, let me live until I will die. But this death seems to be far away from them. But the day they come with a very nice meal to serve them, <laughs> their meaning is, okay, fine, one guy among you, right, will enjoy this nice meal, and then after that, he will die, right? So that's why that good food does not become good food to anyone. You know, right? No one is eating that food. Will you just eat a good, a good meal and then you die? Will you? <laughs> no, so everybody say, hey, Today, maybe it's my day. They are like that. And then, that's why when they see the food, they just run away. They see the nice food, smelling well, very well prepared, but then they cannot enjoy that food because they know that is their day when they have to die. If they knew at least, oh, so-and-so is dying, then the rest you can enjoy your food. Maybe they will enjoy their food, but then they don't tell them anything. They only tell them, okay, fine, eat this good food, that's a sign one of them is about to die. And so, one thing that is very clear here, and that's something that is very important, the Bible says it's not about saying, Lord, Lord, you know, I prophesied in your name. Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. Satan allows many people to do exactly those other things. You can still prophesy as a sinner. You can still go to church as a sinner. You can still do many wonderful works as a sinner. You can still do, do those many things. You can be a pastor. You can be a bishop. You can be an intercessor. You can be baptized as yet a sinner. But one thing that is very sure, without the holiness, no one can see the kingdom of God. No one can see the Lord. You know, live alone. You know, going to the kingdom of heaven, the Bible says, without holiness, without sanctification, no one can see the kingdom of God. And so, we have to be keen on this one truth. 
that God is speaking to us continuously. Hey, you be holy. No. Have no sin. If you have just a speck, little bit of it, you don't need to have uh, maybe a lot of sins and then you, you know, you go to hell. No. Kidogo to even that, even that takes you to hellfire. That's why the Bible says you have to be holy. If you have small sin, are you holy or are you a sinner? Still a sinner, right? And of course, in the eyes of God, there's no bigger sinner or a small sinner. Sinners are just the same. You know that, right? The sinners in the prison somewhere and the sinners who are seated here, they are no different. Sinners Muslim, sinners Catholic, sinners what? Same sinner. Is that so? <laughs> Is that so? The sinner is just a sinner. There's no good sinner or bad sinner. It's just a sinner. But then, because we are receiving too much teachings of Satan that are not biblical, we may feel, ah, I'm, I'm a sinner, but I'm better than so and so. I'm a sinner, but, you know, I have never killed anyone. So I think God will just, you know, look at that. No, God won't look at that. God has already shown his will in the Bible. His will is that you be holy as he is holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's the will of God. If you cannot be holy like God, then the Bible says you cannot go to the kingdom of heaven. And so, as uh, Jesus was speaking to these people in the book of Matthew chapter 7, Uh, verse 20, <clears throat> 23, right? This is uh, what Jesus acknowledges. He says, verse 23, this is, uh, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, right? We don't see where they did wrong things like stealing, like what, you know, no, the Bible doesn't say like that. They are prophets. They have sin in their hearts. Casting out the demons, still sin in their heart. Doing many wonderful works, but they still have sin in their heart. Then, if this prophecy was done, if this miracle were done, and they are still having sin in their hearts, who did those kind of things? Is it God? Is it Satan? Is it God? Is it Satan? Hello? They did many wonderful works, right? And they still have sin in their hearts, right? Who was at work? Was it God or was it Satan? Who was at work? Satan is at work. And so the Bible says, Satan comes to you. In the book of, uh, I think we have to read this one verse, right? Satan comes to you with many lying wonders. You know, Satan is coming to you and deceiving people in many different ways. And so, actually, when you read... Uh, the book of uh, Second Corinthians. Chapter 11, verse 14. Second Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 14. This is uh, actually how Satan works, right? And no marvel, for Satan himself he transformed into an angel of a light. Right? They are doing many wonderful works. They are casting out demons. They are doing many of those things. But then, one thing is very sure is that this is Satan who's at work, who has transformed himself into an angel of a the light. Right? He doesn't come to you as an angel of darkness. He doesn't come to you with horns and with kind of dark clothes with a sickle. Have you ever seen those pictures? Like he's having a sickle trying to harvest the heads of people. Satan is not that, right? The Bible says he comes to you as an angel of the, of the light. And so verse 15 says, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. They come to you as if they are ministers of righteousness. They come to you as liars and deceivers, yet you are not able to tell. These people, they cast out the demons, but that was not the work of God because they still have sin in their hearts. They were doing many wonderful works. 
they prophesied in his name. That was not the will of God. They still have sin in their hearts and still they are doing those things. Satan allows that. And the Bible says, the ministers of Satan, they are transformed into the angel of the light. As if they are there for you. As if they are telling the truth. As if they are guiding you to God. Yet, even though you went to church for many years, I don't know how many you went to church yourself, you still have sin in your heart. That's why. I can say you have not met somebody who can guide you to the right way yet. But I hope you can use this chance continuously. I hope you can be able to explore many, you know, words of the Bible. It's not about, you know, what people are teaching you, but it's all about what the Bible is teaching you. The angel of the light, the Bible says, no marvel, Satan, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of the light. Therefore, it is no great thing it, if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds. That's how Satan is eh, deceiving people. That's how the ministers of Satan also, they transformed themselves into the angel of the light. I mean, they are ministers of, they, it's as if they are ministers of righteousness. But... Look at the people they've ministered to. Are they sinners? Are they righteous? That's the, that's the difference. If they are sinners, then we say, we say what? They can only go to hell. If you go to hell, then that means what? The truth has not come to you yet. That is uh, very sad. People go to hell fire not because they have done something wrong, not because they have not gone to church, not because they have not given offering. No, no, but because they have sin in their hearts and the sin which they have not been able to wash can only take them to, to hellfire. Uh, as I'm concluding, I want to read the book of Isaiah chapter 1 as well. Isaiah chapter 1. <clears throat> and verse 10, this is uh, what the Bible says. Actually, these people also, they are more or less like the people in the book of Matthew chapter 7, right? Uh, God is saying this, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Verse 11, uh, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I'm full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, all of lambs, all of gods. And when you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incenses, and abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbath, the calling of the assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Here, the new moon, verse, verse 14, uh, your new moons and your appointed feast. My soul hurts, and they are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them, right? And when you spread forth your hands, I will hear, hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. These are people who are trying to do what? They are trying to live the life of serving God, right? Is that so? As you read from, uh, you know, verse 10, right? You know, what are they doing? No, they have a multitude of sacrifices. That is verse 11. To what purpose the multitude of your sacrifices? Says the Lord, I'm full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of gods. When you come to appear before me, who has required these things from you? I'm not interested in these things, you people. This is God speaking. These are people, they assemble themselves, they gather themselves, they keep the Sabbath, they're not breaking the Sabbath, you can see here, right? Uh, bring no more incense and abomination unto me, the new moons and Sabbath, the calling of the assemblies, I cannot away with, it is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. God is not interested in those things. He says, I'm not interested. Then, if God is not interested, what does he want? What does he want? The Bible says, we can see verse 18 is like, now the will of God once more again. Verse 18, the Bible says, you know, come now, right? 
Stop what you are doing, right? Stop your Sabbath, your new moons, your word, your sacrifices, your multitude of words. You know, you are treading my courts, but now stop everything and come now. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as... Hello? They have to be as white as snow, right? And they have to be, you know, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as a wool. This is the will of God. Hey, come, let us reason together. People don't want to reason together with God today. They are only busy doing their own things. Let me sacrifice. Let me assemble myself. Let me do this. Let me do. They are doing so many things, of course. But God says, hey, I'm weary. This is a trouble unto me. Hey, who has required this from you? Hey, who told you I'm interested in these things that you are doing? But if you are able to stop and come, listen together with me, says the Lord. Is that so? So today, I, didn't want, to, I want you to, I want to encourage you to come to the Lord and reason together with him. Coming to the Lord means coming to the word of God and now start to reason together with the word of God. What is the word of God saying? Reason together with the word of God is to reason together with God himself. You may say, hey, how am I supposed to reason together with God? No. You don't need to ask yourself that question because the Bible says that in the beginning there was the word the word was with God. The word was, the word was God, right? So as we sit here and reason together with the word of God, I have no doubt whatsoever that God is really happy because we are reasoning together with God himself. Everyone amen? Yes. So this chapel class is meant to guide us, each one of us, so that we can be able to reason together with God as we hear the word of God continuously. And so I'm very thankful yeah, because of the time that we spent together here, I hope you remember these words. And also, I hope, you know, each one of you, you ask yourself to know whether you've been reasoning together with God through the word. And so, uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your love and your grace upon our lives. We thank you because you are leading us continuously according to your perfect will. Today, we spoke about your will. Without doing your will, no one can see the kingdom of heaven. And the Bible says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied. Lord, Lord, we went to church. Lord, Lord, we were baptized. Lord, Lord, we did this and that, and we did it in your name. But, Father God, you are speaking plainly and saying that you never knew them. Father God, that's your will. Your will is that each and every single person that is here may not perish. Your will is that each and every single person that has come to you may not be forsaken. Your will is that we be holy, for the Bible says God is holy himself. May you guide all our brothers and sisters to live as they are fulfilling your will even today. May you allow these uh, uh, people, your beloved people that you send today to listen to your voice, that, Lord, above all, they may be rich in the word of God and that they may keep the voice of God in their hearts. Thank you, Father, for this time that you gave unto us. May you be glorified, Lord. We thank you, Father. We have so many petitions that we want to bring to you today. Many brothers, many sisters, Many of the people that are gathered here today have got petitions in their hearts one by one. Father God, I have no doubt whatsoever that you want them to come out from sin. Once their sins are as, are as white as snow, once their sins have been washed to be as white as wool, then the Bible says you are going to hear their prayers and answer to every single petition that they have in their hearts. And so, Father God, we pray that you may lead us continuously. Thank you today. We give everything into your hands. May you be glorified, Lord. We thank you, Father. We pray, believing that you've done it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you.